Now today, we'll uh, think about reinforced concrete design. And I'm sure most of you are very familiar with uh, reinforced concrete. And uh, so I will first uh, give a very brief uh, introduction to the normal British code based method. And later we will look into the Euro codes. Right? So, uh, reinforced concrete. Now, what is uh, concrete? Uh, you know, how do you find the strength of concrete? We test cubes. Uh, I'm talking about the British method because you are very familiar with that, that method. Then later we see what is Euro method. 150 by 150 by 150 cubes. What we, what we do is we apply a load at a rate of 15 uh, newtons per millimeter squared per uh, per minute and then we apply it gradually and then you will start noticing some cracks and finally it breaks like this and we say force divided by area is equal to stress and in this case we say call it strength We call it strength because uh, we are looking at the strength, right? So, if you look at uh, this, uh, if this method, the first thing you have to notice is that we are having some uh, thick plates here. These thick plates do not allow these to expand easily. So, what happens is. If you look at a material where you apply sigma, we say there will be a tensile stress of new time sigma this way. And we know concrete is a weak material in tension. So, due to this particular expansion effect, so finally this breaks. This way. Although it crushes in compression, it, it, it is due to some of the tensile stresses that are developed in the lateral direction, the final uh, destruction occurs. And we call it the compressive strength. So if you test a cube, due to this confinement offered by the platens of the machine, we get a stress strength FCK, FCU, cube strength. We get a strength, FCU, which we call the cube strength. And cube strength is actually higher than actual. The actual strength is 0.8 times FCU. So that is the first thing you have to understand. So when you say 25 megapascal concrete, the actual strength is only 20. When you say 30 megapascal concrete, actual strength is 0.8 times 30, which is 24 megapascal. So that is the first thing you have to understand. But uh, this is accepted method. And then what we do is, We are testing the cube in compression, but we use this value to design a beam in flexion. Design a beam in flexion. So we say strength in flexure 
So this is a compressive strength in flexure is equal to 0 0.67 times SCU. Actual strength is 0.8 times SCU, but because we use compressive strength and relate it to the flexural strength, we say the strength is 0 0.67 times SCU. And then we divide it by 1.5, which is the gamma M value, which is the partial factor of safety for strength of uh, concrete because uh, there can be significant variation that could occur. To allow for that, we use a value of 0.67 times uh, 1.5, and then you will end up with 0.45 times SCU. So we will end up with 0.45 times SCU. So if you look at the stress strain curve, it will go on like that. And we say when the stress strain in concrete is 0 0.0035, concrete is, has reached its ultimate and uh, no more stress strain can be taken by concrete. No more strain is, can be taken by concrete. Then we look at steel. Steel also, we say it goes like this. And uh, at this particular point, we say we use uh, we actually we use uh, Fy as far as 60 and uh, that is the coal worked steel and then And here the value allowed is Fy divided by 1.15 because the factor of safety is 1.15. And then you get a strain of 0 0.002. And then we say when we are designing concrete, we'll have a compression zone because concrete is good in carrying compression. And we we'll use steel. Steel is good in carrying tension. So, what are you going to say about this region? We say it's cracked. We say it's cracked. And this is something that we have to pay some careful attention. Because we have concrete that is considered as crack, but we ensure the surface crack width is less than 0.3 uh, millimeters. And then we say if the surface crack width is less than 0.3 millimeters, there is no durability issue. There is no durability issue. So then we have to see. How this concrete can deteriorate? And what are the advantages and disadvantages? Because it's cracked. Now, if you look at a cracked section, what can you say about I value? I value is lower than I uncracked. Because the section is cracked. You have to go for the equivalent section consisting of concrete here. The reinforcement here is converted to concrete like that with a modular ratio of E concrete divided by E steel. And so you can convert it to concrete and calculate the I value because it's cracked and you know I value is lower and we know if I is low then the deflection can be high because I is low deflection can be high. Then in addition to that when it comes to deflection we can have immediate deflection 
and long term. Long term means, you know, because this is in compression, concrete shortens gradually, concrete shortens gradually, and it can give rise to a further deflection. So with, with higher deflection, with time, concrete, uh, the crack width in concrete can increase. So we have to uh, ensure that uh, there are dead loads, live loads, and live loads are the ones that are not permanent. So if the, if the dead loads are a reasonable value, and most of the time live loads are not there, then you will find the, the, the increase in deflection with time is only very minute and you cannot, it is not, it is not noticeable. But on the other hand, if the dead loads are very high or the permanent loads are very high, then it's advisable to provide little higher reinforcement because with the long-term creep, you can, you are going to get slightly higher uh, deflection. So you can, on the other hand, you can provide some reinforcement in the compression zone so that the shortening, long-term shortening can be uh, controlled. So in normal situations, you will find that the that the, there's a significant live load and that live load does not exist. So now we have to see, we have to see what is the importance of this uh, cover to concrete, cover. And cover is needed for durability because concrete is a cracked material. So concrete is a cracked material. So we have to see what is the importance of cover to concrete. So we let's uh, see, see what's going to happen. Now we have a reinforcement. And uh, I have already explained how we uh, look at it. And that is uh, in cement, we get tricalcium silicate, dicalcium silicate. And when mix with water, all these will have a byproduct, which is calcium hydroxide. And uh, when we do the concreting, there will be tiny pores because uh, the water cement ratio that we need for complete hydration of uh, cement is 0.23. The, the water cement ratio that we need for complete hydration of uh, cement is 0.23. So, but uh, we'll use water cement ratio of 0.23. 0.5. So what happens to all this excess water? All this excess water is going to evaporate. And they are going to create tiny pores inside. And if we cure the concrete, if we continue to cure the concrete, what will happen? If you are going to if you continue to cure the concrete sufficiently, at least for seven days. What happens? All these calcium hydroxide that forms additionally will go into these tiny pores and fill them up. Then you can create a very good environment around the reinforcement where the pH is going to be around 13 to 12 to 13. pH value inside concrete is 12 to 13. Now, if you look at this steel, Steel has a ferrous oxide layer. Steel has a ferrous oxide layer. It can be in various forms, but I'll just say ferrous and oxide, right? So I'm not going to go deep into the chemical composition, but it's a ferrous oxide layer, like aluminium oxide layer, about round aluminium. So we know aluminium pots can be used for boiling water. No problem. But aluminum is a much more active metal than ferrous. But why can we use aluminum pots for boiling water? Because aluminum is, oxide is a very hard, inert material. So it is not going to react with water. 
If you let react with acids, so that's why we say you know you should not use aluminium pots when you are when you are using uh, acidic materials for cooking. Like you know if you are using uh, vinegar or any anything acidic, you should not use aluminium. But if you are boiling water, no problem. Why? It's very strong. Similarly, ferrous oxide layer is also very stable when pH is 12 to 30. Now, this is the theory. Ferrous oxide layer is very stable when pH value is 12 to 30. So, that is why uh, we have to cure the co concrete properly, not only to gain strength, but also to create sufficient quantity of calcium hydroxide so that this pH value will be significantly high. Then what happens? This ferrous oxide layer is very stable, but if the pH drops to 9 to 10, it becomes unstable. So this is one of the bigger problems. So what happens? Once we cast concrete, there's, there's a, a carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This carbon dioxide has been emitted to the car atmosphere due to vehicle pollution and uh, burning coal. And not only that, even uh, producing cement, we, we, we emit, we emit carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So all these carbon dioxides will start reacting with calcium hydroxide. And uh, it will form carbonic acid. So it will be H2CO3. And with the formation of carbonic acid, calcium carbonate will be can give rise to certain amount of carbonic acid and carbonic acid means pH will start dropping to 9 to 10. So what happens is this carbon dioxide is going to penetrate into the concrete gradually and it will take time and we call it carbonation. Carbonation of concrete. And if you have cured the concrete properly, you have kept sufficient cover now, this concrete is going to be very durable. Why? Because this ferrous oxide layer is going to protect the steel. The reason is ferrous oxide is very stable material when pH is high. But with this, with this carbon, uh, carbonation fronts gradually reaching the reinforcement, what will happen? What happens is, the pH will start dropping to 9 to 10. So after 50, 60 years, sometimes around 70, 80 years after completion of the structure, this can reach and that can give rise to the corrosion of red force. And there are many other factors that can help like presence of water and uh, so and also, if you haven't cured it properly, the lack of calcium hydroxide, a lot of things can happen. And once it starts corrosion, what will happen? The volume of the corrosion product will be higher than the volume of reinforcement. And then the reinforcement, from the reinforcement, you will find that there's pressure exerted outwards. And this pressure can now give rise to spalling of concrete. That means all this concrete will start cracking and we call it spalling of concrete. And you would have seen uh, when the concrete is cracked, you can easily see the reinforcement, highly corroded reinforcement inside. You can see the reinforcement that has undergone severe corrosion inside. Because the volume of the corrosion product is bigger, it will exert pressure outwards. Then you can get durability problems. So these are the problems that we have to attack. Because if you want to find the reinforcement, what you do is, uh, if you know the bending moment, you can find uh, the easiest method is you can use a chart, design chart, and find MOBD squared. And then you can find 100 days of BD. It's not a big deal. 
But the more important thing is to understand this particular process and that will tell you why you have to cure the concrete properly and why the cover is so important. If you don't have adequate cover, you can have problems. And they are durability problems, not the strength. They are not strength related problems, they are durability related problems. So when you are using reinforced concrete, we have to be careful. And uh, whether you use Euro code or the British code, there's no difference. This is a behavior pattern. It has nothing to do with the strength calculation. So you have to be very careful when you are using reinforced concrete. And however, when you are using reinforced concrete, we don't think about any of these things. We think when you pour the concrete and you cure for one or two days, and after that, you know, the attention for curing concrete is very little. And you find that, you know, the structure is, it looks pretty strong. It behaves properly. But after 30, 40 years, the client will find he has to uh, spend extra money to assure uh, longer durability because uh, corrosion has already started. Now, in this process, the amount of cement available in the concrete is also available. So because of that, uh, we generally like to use about uh, 300, 275 ki kilograms of uh, cement per meter cube of concrete. We generally like to have a minimum at least about 275 kilograms per meter cube of uh, 275 kilograms of cement per one meter cube of concrete. So this is a kind of a uh, useful guideline. Uh, always make sure whenever you come up with a mixed design, uh, there's at least 275 kilograms per meter cube. Right? So that's also a rather important number. Right? Now, you know that, you know, red was concrete, it is like this, and it's cracked. <laughs> Here it's cracked. Here you get reinforcement, but still it is safe. No problem because the crack widths are low enough, and the uh, the, the the surrounding uh, concrete will protect provide high pH value, and it's all protected. So we don't have nothing to we we, we don't have anything to worry about. So if now with this little knowledge on concrete, now we see how we how we are going to use concrete in a bridge. What is the easiest uh, way to construct a concrete bridge? Just have a slab bridge. The bridge is slab. And if you are using uh, the BS code, you can approximately say, let's uh, design it for 10 kilonewtons per meter squared pressure. HA comes, can come pretty close to 10 kilonewtons per meter squared. And uh, for Euro code, you can say it will be nine, but there can be other additional loads. And even in this case, there can be an additional load, which we call knife edge load. But uh, generally, we can say you load it, find bending moment as WS card 8, design the reinforcement. And it's a fairly straightforward task. But the question is, is it efficient? Is it efficient? Now that's the question. Is it efficient? On the other hand, you know, you might find. So, so what are the numbers that we are look for? Can we use, say, we have a twelve meter span.
We have eight meters spread. We say about eight meters. Eight thousand millimeters. Eight meters. You might need about six hundred millimeter thick slab. You might need about six hundred millimeter thick slab. And let's see how it is going to behave. What happens? This area of concrete will be uh, it goes like this under compression, and all this other concrete is left, and it's doing nothing other than providing durability for reinforcement. But self-weight, self-weight is 0.6 times 24 equals 0.6 times 24, 14.4 kilonewtons per meter square. So live load is 10 kilonewtons per meter squared. The dead load is about 14.4 kilonewtons per meter squared. So what you see is a situation where the, the sulfate gives us a big penalty. It go, gives us a penalty. It's a it's a problem because it's it's heavy. And when you increase the span, you have to go for even thicker slabs. So the self rate of the structure is going to become uh, fairly high. And in addition to carrying the live load, you have to carry the dead load as well. You have to carry the dead load as well. So, we have to think about how we can actually minimize the penalty that we have to pay for, uh, for uh, the self -weight. So, let's look at another simple example, nothing to do with bridges, but in buildings. So, we have beams. And let's say the span is six meters. We have a slab of 200 millimeter thickness. And the beams are about uh, 600 by 300, right? So what happens? Again, the same scenario. Somewhere here, you get a little bit of compression. Somewhere here, you get a little bit of compression. What else? Everything else is cracked. So we say reinforced concrete is, uh, is, is a very, not a very efficient material because it is cracked. But because we are using natural materials like uh, metal, Sand. And also we use cement. That's the manufactured material. Now, when you ex make metal, do you pay for the environmental damage? No. When you extract sand, do we pay for the environmental damage? No. So, because of that reason, these materials are cheap. These are cheap materials. Because we are just using natural materials, extract the natural materials. We pay the extraction cost, transport cost, but we forget about the environmental cost. So because of that reason, concrete is a 
relatively inexpensive material because we are not paying the actual cost of copper we are paying only for the extraction of the materials and transportation of the material so they, because of that reason we find reinforced concrete is a very nice material very nice construction material because it's uh, it's cost effective sometimes it can be much lower cost than uh, steel especially in sri lankan conditions because our labor costs are also low our labor costs are also low and uh, we we can see that okay no harm i mean it's fact we are carrying extra weight we don't have to worry about any of this because steel is cheap due to though there are inefficiencies still reinforced concrete is a very competitive material or basically it's a cheaper material but this was not the case in after second world war the materials are very scarce like uh, like steel not available so those says actually people have tried many other materials if you uh, demolish a very old uh, slab in in a building in colombo you will find they have used bamboos they have used bamboo as the reason in addition to uh, the steel they have used bamboo as well and uh, so basically uh, we have to look at how this evolved so so if you look at uh, uh, bs uh, bs sports they all support something called rib slabs so in the concept of rib slabs what you do is you go for thin slabs like 92 90 mm and you will end into some ribs so it's a kind of a composite sense system the beam actually carry the slabs support the slab and the task of the slab is to support uh, transfer the load over a short distance so because we are using a thin slab for a large span we can use less concrete because the spans are lower the reinforcement requirement is also less and uh, you have to use a little more form because now we are having beams then if you look at the beam beam is deep and it's a very efficient form for carrying flexion so what we do is for the slab we minimize the slab thickness but we use a beam of sufficient depth with a reasonable spacing so that you know we we can minimize the amount of concrete needed in the slab and this is called rib slabs and in all buildings you would have seen rib slabs but these days we do not use rib, rib slabs then you have to ask why why do not why we are not using these efficient structural forms the reason is uh, after the world war uh, by around 19 mid 1950 the 50s around 1955 onwards the shortage of material ended and people started manufacturing steel in larger quantities and then earlier material was scarce and expensive labor was plenty it was cheap gradually material cost started coming down labor cost started going up then everybody found that 
anything that you need less labor is more efficient, more cost effective. So people started gradually abandoning these more efficient structural forms in preference to uh, low overall cost, low lower overall cost, where the overall cost came from the cost of labor and cost of material. So they started looking at the overall cost rather than the material cost because labor costs started rising. So today the scenario is there's a clear division today. The scenario is in countries like Australia, the labor cost is about 40 to 50 Australian dollars per hour. So they, they, they always try to minimize the labor cost and they do not care about material cost. They do, they do not care about material. But so what has happened is we also have blindly followed what is written in the books and which says try and minimize the labor and uh, don't worry about materials. So we have also have in countries like Sri Lanka. So we also have uh, blindly followed some of these practices because we started getting uh, contractors from Japan, contractors from uh, other countries, and uh, all these countries have high labor costs. So then we found they have neat construction and so on. And we also started thinking in those lines. So we actually uh, uh, abandoned these uh, ideas. So if you want to, and later, when, uh, Somewhere in 1990s, uh, we uh, at Boroto University started uh, looking at uh, cheaper alternatives for uh, slabs. And we, uh, we found that in India, they have something like this. And later we developed it for uh, concrete bridges as well. So the idea is you will have a beam something like uh, 200 millimeters deep, about 160 millimeters wide. And then uh, you will place the, uh, place the slab like this. You place the reinforcement like this. Have one element there, like a 10 millimeter bar. And so add some reinforcement here and then do something like this and then have some concrete cover to all this and create a stone. And we found that, you know, these are very efficient because uh, we are keeping uh, this uh, slab thickness to about 90 millimeter or uh, around 90 millimeter overall with the speed and everything. And uh, sometimes you can even go for even lower depths, but we, we found uh, something around 90 millimeter is uh, very uh, efficient. And uh, then, uh, you know, these uh, beams can come uh, with the spacing of about 1.5 to 1.8 meters. Uh, and uh, the reinforcement in the slabs can be very little, like uh, something like three bars, and sometimes these bars can be even R6 if the loads are light. That is just my steel bars, so they can, this gate can be uh, three numbers of uh, H8 bars, high yield bars of eight millimeter diameter. So we found many things where. Uh, very significant amount of reinforcement can be reduced. Right? And then, uh, so this is, these are the systems that we developed for uh, houses. And uh, with this development, we thought, okay, why not 
try this system for bridges. So we started looking at it like this. And we had uh, something like uh, 75 millimeter thickness, 90 millimeter thickness. And then we'll have some concrete above and there'll be some locking mechanism here with reinforcement because we'll always run a reinforcement here and put the other reinforcement below it. So all these components will become locked in. So you cannot separate them because they are locked by the reinforcement. And then we thought we can go for something like 175 millimeters to 200 millimeters. Top slab. So instead of using a 600 millimeter thick slab, now we are using a 200 millimeter slab. And again, that is 200 millimeter is a magic number. Because uh, when you have a slab as the deck, we have to, in British code, we have to design it for 10 ton load or 100 kilonewton load. So when you have a load of 100 kilonewtons, what can happen is there can be punchy shear failure. So to prevent punchy shear failure, you need a minimum thickness of 160 millimeters. You need a minimum thickness of 160 millimeters for the slabs. So we thought, okay, let's use 200 because then it's absolutely safe. No chance for any punchy shear failure. So you can see this 200 millimeter, 175 to 200 millimeter is a magic number. You should not go anything below that. So 175 is enough, but sometimes, you know, to give a little more robustness, we can actually use 200 millimeter as well. So because now you can see we are making a significant saving because uh, instead of using a 600 millimeter slab, we are going for 200 millimeter slab with some beams. Once in a while. So, what are the advantages of this system? We are having a system of 200 millimeter slab, and we are minimizing the reinforcement because now the slab spans only 1.5 meters. Slab spans only 1.5 meters. So, we can make a significant saving in the reinforcement. Because you don't need a lot of reinforcement here to carry the uh, load from the uh, vehicle. Because here you can see when you have a bridge, we'll have a situation like this. So let's draw a proper bridge to understand the actual scenario. So we have a beam, then you have a slab. And then what we do is we we'll have the walkway for about 1.5 meters, and then the road starts. So this is the walkway, which is, and the handrail will come here. And this area is subjected to five kilonewtons per meter square. And this is the area where the slab is 200. And these beams are at 1.5 meters. And these are subjected to about 10 kilonewtons per meter squared. But in those areas, this slab is continuous. The slab can be made continuous. No areas. So what is the net effect? What is the net effect? The net effect is that we have a slab. Instead of using 600 millimeter thick slab, 
we are actually having an overall depth of 600 millimeters. Why? Because now we are removing most of this concrete that is adding to the weight. Most of this concrete is removed that is adding to the weight. So what will happen to the overall bending moments that the beam, that the that these beams have to carry? The overall bending moments have been reduced. Overall bending moments have been reduced drastically. And because we have reduced the overall bending moment, because the bending moment will come from self-weight and the live load. Self-weight and the live load. So what we do is we reduce the self-weight significantly while the live load cannot be touched. The live load is, is already specified. So you can't do anything about the live load, but we are redu significantly reducing the self-weight. Now what will happen? What happens is the overall bending moment, which will be given by the factor of safety for uh, the self-weight, factor of safety for the live load, which can go up to about 1.5, this can go up to about 1.2, right? So what we do is we are actually minimizing the self-weight while keeping the structural capacities unaffected. While keeping the structural capacities unaffected, we are reducing the self-weight of the structure in doing so, we are reducing the overall bending moment of the structure. Because of that reason, you will often find a beam depth which is either equal or slightly more than the depth of the equivalent slab bridge can allow us to have a bridge. So, what actually happens is we are removing a lot of material from from the deck and in doing so you would have also heard that when you are casting concrete to prevent early thermal cracking thermal and shrinkage cracking what do you have to do we have to apply minimum reinforcement and minimum reinforcement depends on the thickness of the so, not only to carry the flexure, but to prevent the early thermal stressors, uh, the, the tracks due to early thermal stressors and the shrinkage stressors, we have to provide minimum reinforcement. So, thicker the slab, higher the amount of reinforcement. But what we are doing in this particular system is, we are actually removing this particular penalty as well. If we are removing this particular penalty as well. So what we do is we get the pre beam precast. We can precast the beam like uh, 300 millimeters by 600. And these days uh, there are plenty, you know, trains are readily available. You can just hire a train easily. And these uh, 600 by uh, 300 by 600, and let's say eight meters, eight meters long, and uh, so it is. The weight is uh, 0.6 multiplied by 0.3 multiplied by 24 multiplied by eight. Now let's see what is the weight of the beam, and weight of the beam is 0.6 multiplied by 0.3 multiplied by 24 multiplied by eight. 34.56 kilonewtons or 3.5 tons. The weight of the beam is 3.5 tons. So, so you can see it's, you can easily hire a 5 ton uh, crane and uh, lift the beam. It's not a major problem. It's not a major problem. Then we are, we, need, we are going to cast something like say 75 millimeter thick slabs. We are going to cast something like 75 millimeter slabs uh, of, lay, of 450 millimeter width. 450 millimeters wide. 
and uh, 75, so 1.5 into 0.075 into 0.45 into 24. Now let's look at the weight because I'm looking at the uh, constructability of the bridge. Constructability of the bridge. Because you know, whenever you do something, we have to always look at the constructability. How we are going to construct it? 0.075 into 0.45 into 24. And that is 1.215 kilonewtons or 1,121, uh, 120 kilograms. The weight of the uh, slab panel is 120 kilograms, so even four people can lift it. Or on the other hand, uh, you know, you can have some hooks and uh, uh, you, if you have two hooks, you can easily get, get it lifted by the crane. If, it, if you are going to get a crane at the site, you can easily lift it. And then you will again ask, what is this magic number, 450? The reason is then you can provide the reinforcement at 150 millimeter centers. So this, this reinforcement can be at 150 millimeter centers. The next one will again come here. So the reinforcement of that will also be at 150. So, so you, you select 100, 450 millimeter as the width. Then what we do is now we want to make sure that there's adequate uh, amount of shear links here because shear uh, can be uh, somewhat uh, significant at the supports, only at the supports. And then we'll provide another link like this. And in that link, we'll provide a reinforcement here like that. And then below that, we provide some continuity reinforcement. So there's reinforcement here. There is reinforcement here. So what happens is then we cover it to ensure that the overall thickness becomes 175 to 200. Overall thickness becomes 175 to 200. And then what happens is, now we have a bridge uh, where if you look at the behavior, now let's look at the overall behavior. And I have already shown it here, the kind of uh, situation because we are going to get a fairly advantageous situation here with the continuity of the top slab, continuity of the top slab in the lateral or the transverse direction. In the transverse direction, and this is uh, the page number 11, Civil Engineering Section of Committee 11, Civil Engineering Section of Committee 12. Right, and then we look at now. Let's see what is the overall behavior. Now I'm going to draw the big picture. So this is a slab, we have one beam here, another beam here, another beam here. So this, uh, this. So between this, we get 1.5 meters. 1.5. And if I take the center, we get 3.75, 3.75, very comfortable with for a, a bridge, 3.75 meter wide lens, because in Sri Lanka generally we use 3.5 meter wide, uh, 3.5 meter width for the road. The reason is uh, the maximum width of the vehicle that is allowed is around 2.4, but sometimes you get uh, vehicles going up to about 2.6 meters. But uh, so you can see when you go for 3.5 meters, it's very, uh, it is quite sufficient. So now we have the wearing course. 
and uh, we have the vehicles nodes in I'm just using this magic number again, 10 kilonewtons per meter squared, because I told you the other day that, you know, for bridges, uh, 10 kilonewtons per meter squared is a very uh, reasonable load, whereas here we are going to get 5 kilonewtons per meter squared. A later day, I will show you how to uh, analyze the bridge using drainage and how to apply the loads. Uh, that's uh, another study, uh, another day. But, uh, you know, the, for the time being, we'll consider that, you know, very reasonable values like this, just to understand the, uh, the theory. But uh, later day, I'll show you how this can be converted to a greenage of beams and how the loads can be placed with a reasonable accuracy to get the actual bending moments, right? So, uh, today we are not going to worry about those things because we are trying to understand the overall overall concept. How to think about optimizing a reinforced concrete bridge. So that's what we are going to concentrate today. Right. So now we can see, now we have optimized the bridge. And uh, you can also see that, you know, when you apply the loads, you are going to get uh, the bending moment. So you get, uh, it's like this. So you are, you are not going to get a sharp rise here. You get a bending moment diagram like that. And uh, is this continuity? So we are providing top reinforcement as well as bottom reinforcement. And we can easily come up with a reasonable level of reinforcement. And what we generally do is uh, we have the beam like this. These reinforcements are discontinuous, but what we do is we provide the continuous mat at the top. And uh, this continuous mat generally comes with 12 millimeter bars, H12. But because we have optimized the bridge, in a normal bridge, this mat will be out of H12. But because we have optimized the bridge, you will often find we can use H10. H10 in both directions. And generally in bridges, we have again this uh, magic rule. Uh, when you are providing reinforcement, provide the reinforcement at 150, center to center. The, again, the idea is, if you have a lot of small diameter bars at close interval, the crack widths can be reduced. The crack widths can be reduced. That's a general rule. If you have a smaller diameter bars at closer spacing, the crack widths can be distributed and the, the overall crack widths can be reduced. So generally we use this magic rule again, that is, the maximum spacing of reinforcement is generally limited to about 150 center to center in bridges. Those are good practices. So, so just because we we optimize, we need not deviate from <laughs> good practices. But uh, if you really want to optimize, you can even try a eight, a change. But because you are designing the reinforcement, you can see whether H8 also can be used. Again, uh, you might ask why H8, 10, 12? Now, you know these days, uh, although the steel prices have come down, they are, uh, steel is not as cheap as uh, earlier because still the one ton is about 250,000 rupees. So early it was prohibitively expensive, now it's reasonable. You get about 420 bars here, you get only about 280 bars here, you get only about 180 bars here. So you can see, using H8, these days is again going to be pretty economical. So you have to again think about it. But because you are designing, because we are designing with the bending moment diagram, we can model it as a village and get the bending moments after we apply the loads we can easily find the reinforcement requirement fairly accurately. And then 
we can provide that particular reinforcement requirement or slightly more than what you really need as the minimum. So, uh, can you understand this particular uh, concept? Can somebody give a feedback, please? Uh, yes, sir. Join here so it's that the study it's material, clear. sir. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so that is the other. So, I'm just looking at the chats. Right, okay. Uh, right, okay. So, you can, you can clear, it's the concept is clear. Now, we look at the studies we have done so far. And what, what we have done so far. So, for that, I will share the screen. Can you see the screen? Yes, sir. We can see. Yeah. Okay. So I'll I'll go quickly go to the. Uh, uh, so these are the loads, uh, and you can see these are the. the these the you, these the earlier load, the magic number of uh, something like uh, thirty kilonewtons per meter per lane, uh, which comes. And if the lane width is three meters, it, this will represent something like 10 kilonewtons per meter square. And this is HP vehicle. And you can see these are the uh, 2006 loads. And these are the Euro code loads. Again, you can see this magic number 900 kilonewtons per meter square with some additional uh, knife edge type loading or the axle loading or the tandem loading. And we can, so that's why, you know, you have to go with the grill edge and this is two work out the actual bending moments. Uh, the, uh, when you are doing a design, so that's why I use the approximate value like 10 kilonewtons per meter squared, uh, just to explain the actual scenario. And then uh, you can have a single axles or tandem axles or single wheels. And uh, so uh, I will quickly go to the, uh, reinforced concrete slabs. Uh, reinforced concrete, uh, con reinforced slab bridges can be simply supported or continuous. Uh, it's very heavy due to depth of the, because it's uh, packed under the section. This concrete just adds to the weight of and does not, uh, does nothing except protecting the bottom mat reinforcement. So the solution is beam slab bridges. Uh, but the construction is difficult because you need for uh, some uh, special formwork. So because of that reason, we can go for precasting. And uh, so the solution is precasting, and a, a bridge has been selected with 3.5 meter wide uh, roads, 1.5 meter wide uh, pedestrian pavement. And uh, the kind of slab is like this. And here you can see a very similar arrangement. And then you can see the arrangement of the bridge and uh, how it can be modeled with the grid of beams. And uh, this has been modeled as a continuous bridge. So basically you have a pier in the middle and two abutments. And uh, this has been, uh, uh, model as uh, for the continuous bridges uh, because you can see uh, you can go up to about uh, 12 meters span 12 meters span so uh, if you consider 12 meter 12 meter means 40 feet and 40 feet means a fairly wide uh, waterway fairly wide waterway but if you go with uh, two two numbers of uh, 40 feet you get eight feet wide waterway. And if you can have a pier in between, you can use reinforced concrete and this particular optimized structural form. Now, this is uh, one of the actual bridges that we built uh, in 2012-13 era at Mahiyanganaya. And uh, so you will find that this bridge has a width of about 12 feet. And so because of that, we use three beams uh, uh, having a span of about six feet. 
and then uh, the length of the bridge is uh, 300 feet and you can see the spans are around 14 feet so small spans and uh, and uh, this particular bridge was built uh, during the construction of the reservoir rehabilitation of the reservoir so when the bridge was built uh, there was no water in the reservoir so it, the foundation was pretty easy so that's why we have gone for a smaller beams with uh, 14 feet instead of uh, longer bridges uh, longer beams where the beam is also precast uh, i think uh, i can't remember whether we precast the beam or in situ cast but the slabs are definitely uh, in situ cast sorry precast slabs are all precast i think beams are also precast uh, so basically uh, you might ask uh, what was the cost of this 300 feet long bridge and uh, Mahiangade, this, you know, because uh, sand was readily available, you know, we got sand at a very low cost, but everything else came at the normal prices. And the cost of the bridge was 6 million rupees. 6 million rupees, very low cost. And uh, so you can see uh, the cost of uh, the bridge is only 6 million rupees. And uh, this, uh, this is actually in front of the uh, Mayangare Rajamaha Vihare, and there's a big uh, reservoir in front of that. And uh, during the rehabilitation of the reservoir, an artificial island was created, and uh, this uh, bridge is to access the artificial island where the Sima Malake is located. So, that is the historical value of the bridge. But the most important thing is it's a reinforced concrete bridge which was designed to carry a load of 10 kilonewtons per meter squared. But I think I have checked it for 25 units of HB as well. 25 units of HB as well. So uh, based on all these things, we actually came up with, uh, we did a study. And uh, so one of the problems is uh, you have to first select the size of the beam. To select the size of the beam, we came up with a table. Uh, because, you know, if you have the uh, H is given by a certain equation, but on the other hand, we have given the size of the beam also in this one. And uh, so depth of the precast beam up to 12 meters, you can go for 300 by 650 uh, when, the, when it is continuous. And then, uh, not, we did not stop there, but we actually went to the next step. We designed, uh, we designed the bridge, and then we came up with, uh, uh, we came up with a set of curves that will give the reinforcement requirement. That will give the reinforcement requirement along the bridge. So, uh, so if it is uh, five meters, you know, based at di different locations, what is the reinforcement requirement? Uh, and we have plotted it. So basically, you don't have to do the design of the bridge. You can just check it. Uh, you can straight away provide this reinforcement and do a checking for the bridge rather than actually come doing a complete design because we have given the reinforcement also. So basically, you can see the arrangement is what is given here. The arrangement is what is given here. And uh, you can come up with extremely cost-effective bridge solutions. And the most important thing is this particular reinforcement, this link should go around this particular reinforcement. You can see a reinforcement there and this particular link should go around the reinforcement because the idea is, you know, we want to lock everything together so that uh, when they are subjected to high stressors, all will act as one composite member. So those are the precautions you have to take. So is that clear? The application? Any uh, response? Yes. Right? So basically, uh, you know, reinforced concrete, what you have to understand is, if you provide, if you want, you can provide some concrete here, but it will just add to the weight of the bridge without doing anything useful. So because of that, we can get very cost-effective solutions for bridges using precast reinforced concrete sections where we minimize the weight of concrete 
and in doing so we minimize the bending moment on the maximum bending moment at each section and uh, in doing so we we can actually reduce the amount of reinforcement needed we can reduce the amount of concrete needed and because we are we are precasting we can maintain the quality right now uh, now i'll stop sharing but i will look at some other important uh, aspect and that is uh, you know how the euro code can be brought to the scene and for that uh, i will look at uh, i'll share the screen again with a different presentation mm. Now uh, I will look at uh, the durability uh, table and uh, I will explain how the Euro code deals with uh, the, the how Euro code deals with the cover requirements. So if you look at Euro code, can you see the Euro code extract? Yes, sir, we can see. Yeah, yeah. So basically, I mean, uh, we might have to, uh, for generally we go for XC3 for uh, buildings and uh, external concrete for sheltered from rain also, you can go for XC3. Uh, or on the other hand, you can even go for XC4, which is a little more stringent than XC3. Because, because these are bridges, we cannot say they are, they are, they are sheltered from rain, but you can have a detail which is, which will make sure that it's sheltered from rain, but we'll uh, go for the next exposure condition, XC4. Right. Now, then, then Eurocode gives another table. And uh, S4 is the normal exposure condition, S4, for 50-year durability. But in bridges, we are going for about 100 years. So because of that reason, if it is XC4, it says increase the class by 2. Increase the class by 2. So S4 should become S6. S4 should become S6. Then it says, if you are going to use 50 megapascal concrete cube strength, 50 megapascal concrete cube strength, you can reduce the class by 1. So that means Eurocode is promoting the use of high strength concrete. High strength concrete. Even with reinforced concrete, it's promoting high strength concrete. So the next question is how do you get this kind of high strength concrete at site condition? Then it says you can reduce this, reduce it if you are going to precast the members where you are not going to walk on the reinforcement you can reduce the class by one. Here it says reduce the class by one. Here again says reduce the class by one. Here it says increase the class by two. So basically the class will become S4. Because here it says increase the class by two, reduce the class by one, reduce the class by one. So finally it will become plus two, minus one, minus one. So it is S4. And if you look at S4, XC3, what is the cover requirement? 30. 30 millimeters. But in Eurocode, it says uh, if it is a slab where you are casting it without any problem, it's 30. But in the case of beams, what is the cover requirement? Because uh, if the beam is also precast, we can use 30. But with the beam is in silicon cast, only the slab is precast. Then increase by two. We are going for high strength concrete. Reduce the class by one. We cannot reduce this one, so we have to go for strength class five. So if the beam is in silicon cast, we need 35 millimeter. But not only 35 millimeter. Anything in silicon cast, then this uh, code says have a construction tolerance of 10 millimeter so the beams will need 35 plus 10 45 millimeter cover because the slab is precast we can go with 30 millimeter cover and because uh, there can be minor variations 
I would go for something like 35 millimeter cover for the straps and uh, about 40 millimeter cover for the beads. We just add a little more so that, you know, if you use, if I'm using uh, 40 to 50 megapascal concrete. But on the other hand, if you are going using uh, lower strength concrete, if you are using lower strength concrete, like uh, 45 megapascal or 37 megapascal, you will you cannot reduce the class by one, so you will need higher cover. So this is how you will work out the cover requirement according to Euro codes. So so Euro codes are very stringent with the concrete quality, and that's why the the lecture that I did on how to achieve a good quality concrete is important. So what we do is next uh, lecture. We concentrate a little more on this concrete technology part to understand how we can actually come into terms with getting 50 megapascal concrete at, at the site conditions. And I'm sure, uh, you know, with site mixing, you wouldn't have, would have got 50 megapascal, uh, but uh, I'm going to show you how 50 megapascal concrete can be obtained under site conditions. And we'll uh, look deeper into the design aspects in the next lecture. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine, sir. Right, okay. Okay, then uh, time is almost up. Shall we end the lecture? And if there's any question in the chat channel, I can answer. I think there's one question in the chat section. Yeah, if we go for in-situ rooms, it's difficult to do form of it. Yes, if you always, it's good to go for uh, precasting. And this is the solution. Deal of for beam to be precast, slab to be precast. And not only that, I mean, even if you want, you can even make the pier precast by precasting the, sh the shell and then filling it uh, with concrete inside. So even that is possible. So basically, uh, this is a concept. Uh, bridges should be precast. There's no question about it. Not only the bridge, even the piers can be precast. And uh, one of the things that we generally uh, do is, uh, uh, so this is actually quite possible in uh, dry zone, not in the wet zone. Uh, so if you want to create a bridge, what do you do? Generally, we think about piling. But can't we do something like this? Can't we bring an excavator and bring a big hole? Fill it with ABC with 12% cement. Then what happens? You create a big concrete block. And if the weight of the concrete block is significant, then you can easily anchor the bridge into that. And what we do is we make a big hole, fill it with ABC, and we bury precast pre elements into it, precast columns. And the columns can be odd shaped like this. And the reinforcement is projecting out in the precast elements. So we have reinforcement projecting out from the precast element. We fill it up this place and then we start the real abutment because we see now the abutment is fully anchored into the concrete block. So this type of simple techniques can be used but unfortunately our engineers have not tried that type of solutions because uh, uh, because, you know, we generally try to be conservative. Uh, actually, in dry zone bridges, you really don't need piling or anything. Uh, you can, during the dry season, you simply take a huge, uh, large excavator and uh, excavate a big hole, fill it up with uh, ABC, so that even if scouring occurs, still this concrete block is heavy enough to uh, remain as one part and uh, ensure the stability 
and then uh, you will bury some precast concrete columns with reinforcement projecting out so that you can anchor the the bridge firmly into the concrete block that you have artificially created and that can become the foundation because this is a big area so stressors will not be a major problem because you can see we are talking about the weight of the vehicles which is the weight of the bridge is on much lower now maybe about 50 percent the weight of the uh, weight of the vehicles so it's a lightweight bridge and because the bridge is lightweight what you need is a large concrete block to anchor the anchor the bridge into the bedrock so once you do that uh, you know you can fill the abc to a sufficient height and then uh, bury the con uh, precast concrete columns and then uh, cast the uh, part that is visible uh, from the bridge uh, that can be cast with formwork and inside that is uh, the columns that you have buried the reinforcement from the columns that you have buried and then you can build up the uh, pier very fast because you have not spent much time for foundation now it's all done uh, with uh, just uh, filling a big hole with ABC but uh, to ensure that ABC has uh, concrete properties rather than just ABC because ABC can be subjected to erosion uh, so we make it a concrete block by mixing ABC with 12 percent cement and when you do that you get a mass concrete and the because mass concrete is not durable what we do is we uh, precast uh, columns or shape columns and bury the columns inside the mass concrete so mass concrete and proper concrete will all become one unit and uh, what we get where we get the reinforcement is inside the proper concrete that is the precast elements and then uh, you can have a positive connection between the foundation and the bridge so even if uh, even if during a flood time uh, nothing will happen to the bridge because it's properly anchored to the uh, foundation and foundation is massive and uh, nothing can lift it from the bed of the uh, river because you have gone sufficiently deep like uh, four or five meters deep in deep uh, and uh, reach uh, reasonably strong soil layers uh, so if the even if some scour occurs two three meters of scour occurs till the the bottom of the uh, foundation is not exposed so you can easily do it no need to have huge soil investigations uh, if you can drive one or two boreholes just to see whether there are very weak layers underneath but uh, you can easily uh, construct a bridge without taking much time provided that you do precasting for the whole bridge and precasting for the whole bridge is quite possible with reinforced concrete and next day i'm going to show the concrete technology behind high strength concrete where most of the precasting operation can be carried out under uh, site conditions you don't have to actually go for a concrete yard to do the precasting so that's the kind of concrete technology I'm going to bring in the next time. Is that clear? There were some other questions as well, sir. Uh, what is that question? Uh, what, uh, yes. what is the reason for going for in-situ compared to precast? Is it only speed of construction or no? anything related to durability? No, actually, it's, it's, it's the formwork. Because in, when you have a river, you can't do a formwork. So the only option is precasting. In bridges, in-situ casting is problematic because we are dealing with water. Right? So precasting is the easiest option. On the other hand, we can we might do uh, reinforced concrete bridges of this type over existing roads. So again, precasting is the easiest. So uh, uh, this balance cantilever is a completely different philosophy 
and i will explain balanced cantilever when we when we talk about continuous figures because balanced cantilever method is not used to for normal construction it's a very special construction that we use where the bridges are something like 60 70 meter spans or 100 meter spans we go for balanced cantilever but uh, our scope is something like 5 to 12 meter spans today but uh, balanced cantilever is com something completely different i will explain it later later on when you are dealing with uh, pre stress concrete continuous figures okay and then how can we is ppt uh, uh, so somebody is asking for the powerpoint presentation of the lecture series and uh, i can actually send it uh, because uh, today's lecture i have used the same uh, uh, presentation in the first day i skipped some of the slides so it's the same uh, powerpoint presentation but uh, today i have used another powerpoint presentation and i can share it with you uh, with uh, with uh, i will share it uh, i will send it okay. so that you know you will get, from the chat group you will get it okay. yeah we will share that to the whatsapp group that we have created yes whatsapp group yeah yeah, yeah. okay uh, anything and else there was a uh, one question sir what is the reason for placing 75 mm thick slabs initially between beams without casting all at once is it for easiness uh, yeah, or... yeah actually the, you know even uh, even if you, so the whole idea is uh, we are on a bridge we are on a river right so bring a crane place the beams then place the slabs right because once you place the beams uh, you know you can keep on uh, adding the slabs even manually but if you want you can use the crane and uh, keep the slabs so once you place it you have a walking platform a platform on which you can walk then what we do is we'll combine them and make it one unit so that for the live loads what you get is not the individual beam capacity or the live loads what you get is the com composite section composite section is very good in sharing the loads and also uh, composite section is deeper than the beam so so finally you will get a so you might cast a 600 mm beam and uh, you cast a 75 plus uh, another 125 all all together 200 so the overall depth of the system will become 800 mm and this 800 mm deep beam slab system is now resisting the live loads so it's very efficient so that's why we go for pre casting and even when you go with pre casting sometimes uh, when you are cast place in the slabs uh, under the beam sometimes we prop the beam at the middle the, just to make sure the bending moment on the beam is lower and once we once the concrete hardens only we remove the prop in the middle or one third points that way we can actually reduce the initial uh, reinforcement requirement in the beam and uh, generally what we have to do is we have to calculate the reinforcement requirement in the beam uh, when it is uh, when it is supporting the uh, weight of the precast slabs and the in situ concrete and then we calculate the reinforcement requirement for live loads only and then we have to add those two and provide it as the reinforcement because you know initially the beam is rectangular when it is resist in the live loads it's a flange beam so we have to add the two reinforcement separate is that clear yes sir that is clear that's clear. right okay and sir so regarding this uh, yeah yes sir and regarding this uh, video recordings of uh, previous lectures uh, we, it is already uploaded to IS, isl media youtube channel uh, so uh -huh. specific links we will share to the whatsapp group okay excellent excellent okay. Yeah. and uh, i would like to invite engineer bashita to do the word of thank okay bondukar Uh, dear attendees, uh, I would like to extend a warm word of thanks to everyone who made this webinar on the structural design of highway bridges possible. 
uh, we are grateful to CSC for organizing this informative session and to the esteemed speaker, Professor Jay Singh, for sharing his valuable insights. I would also like to express my uh, sincere gratitude to Engineer Kamala Gunawardana, the chairperson of CSC, for her support and encouragement. Uh, our thanks also go out to the ISL Secretariat, uh, Publicity Department, and IT team for their effort in promoting and hosting this event. Finally, uh, we are excited to announce that the next session of this webinar series will be held on next Monday. Uh, we hope to see you all there for another enlightening and informative session. Thank you all uh, once again for your participation and support. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Vashida. Yes, thank I, you, I Professor. Forgot, forgot to mentioned that uh, our next session will be on not not on tuesday uh, it will be on monday because of some technical issue uh, uh, so that will be on 13th monday thereafter it will be continue on all tuesdays yes madam yeah thank you thank you um, thank you professor a great uh, <laughs> can't hear you but anyway i i knew that so thank you Bashita, and thank you banduga for your Great partnership here. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Good night. Good night.